This episode of Table Topics is brought to you by EasyRollerDice.com. Need a bunch of gaming dice but don't want to pay 85 cents a piece at your local shop? Don't even think about the big bag of random junk, oddities, and damaged dice from those other guys. At EasyRollerDice.com, you can snag 10% off all products right now. And that means you can grab the giant 105-count bag of Factory First Dice with a bonus full-sized velvet bag for less than $23. Shipping is also always free in the USA. Go to www.easyrollerdice.com and enter code RPG at the checkout and save 10% right now. Hello and welcome to Table Topics, the general advice and discussion podcast from the RPG Academy. I am Michael, and this is Table Topics, episode number 73, Shadows of the Demon Lord, an interview with Robert Schwab. So if you're not familiar with Robert Schwab, pick up a random RPG book off your shelf, and there's a good chance his name might be on it. He has a very long list of uh, credits and a a healthy pedigree of a uh, system and content creator for various systems, including most recently Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but also 3.5, 4th edition, the Song of Ice and Fire role-playing game, among many others. Recently, Mr. Schwab has decided to found his own company, which is Schwab Entertainment, and their first product that they're launching is a brand new role-play system called Shadows of the Demon Lord. And Caleb and I sit across the virtual table with Mr. Schwab, and we talk a lot about his system. We, we spend more time talking about the mechanics and the crunch of the system, I think mostly because we had already had a chance to play test the game, uh, which you will be able to hear those episodes coming out soon as a part of the trial series of podcasts. Um, so we got into a lot of the mechanics first, and then we kind of circled back around and talked more about the setting. Overall, it was a fantastic conversation. He was an amazing guest, and uh, we're both very big fans of the game, and we hope you will be too. By the time you listen to this, the Kickstarter will have launched, or I believe it might launch the very next day, if you listen to this when it comes out. Definitely worth your time to take a look at the Kickstarter. There will obviously be links uh, in the show notes. So anyway, on to the show. Here is Table Topics, episode number 73, Shadows of the Demon Lord, interview with Robert Schwab. Welcome to Table Topics. I am Michael, and I have brought along with me, as I always do, my favorite co-host and yours, the Caleb G. Caleb, how are you doing tonight, sir? You know what, Michael? I'm pretty effing ecstatic tonight because we have an incredibly special person. We have with us Robert Schwab. Hello! It's good to be here! Who, uh, again, has a healthy pedigree, uh, lots of years uh, with multiple role-playing game supplements. He's been involved in... Pretty much if you've played it and you liked it, his name's probably somewhere on it. And I had the the fortune at Winter Fantasy this year to play test a new game that he is developing called Shadows of the Demon Lord. And more so, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Robert himself. And uh, we brought him on the show tonight to talk about his new game. So, Robert, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to start with some easy questions. So, what was really the inspiration? Like, there, there's so many games that are out right now. I think the easy thing to do would be to take an existing game and make a new setting. Like, you know, 13th Age did that with uh, Primeval Thule, and then you got um, Galanthia for another 13th Age, Eberron, Forgotten Realms. So what was it about Shadows of the Demon Lord that you're like, no, this has to be its own game, and I have to get this out? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question, and uh, it's one that I have, I have that has kept me up late at night wondering why the hell I, did, I, I decided to do this in the first place. But um, <laughs> first of all, uh, thank you very much, guys, for having me on the show, and uh, it's great to be here. Um, I guess the thing about Shadow of the Demon Lord, you know, there's there's a side of it that is I like grim, nasty, dark, scary stuff, and I like to gross out my players. I like to explore uh, mature themes in some of the games, and I also don't like to pull punches. 
So there would on that on that set, you know, I could have just done a setting for Pathfinder or Thirteenth Age or some other game. Uh, but then there's also the side of it that comes from my experience of as a as just a guy who runs games. And what I kind of realized is that as I'm getting older and as my gaming groups are getting older and as our entertainment pie is being gobbled up by other things, the amount of time we have to invest in a tabletop role playing game experience like we used to 20, 30 years ago is shrinking. And so the objective for this game, the design goal really was to remove all the obstacles to playing a traditional RPG experience. And by traditional, I mean there's a game master, there are players, we're not trying to... I didn't want to do anything that would you know, make you rethink how role-playing games work. There's a reason why role-playing games work the way they work and have worked so successfully for 70 years. Because we know it's, it's our language game, that we it's the language we, we use to talk uh, about role-playing games. And so that was really kind of the, the objective, was to just try to remove all the bullshit from, in front of it, from, from role-playing and let people who want to be able to role-play an RPG do so without having to sift through a stack of 30 bucks or, you know, or, or be commit themselves to a three year campaign or something like that. Yeah. That was one of the, the things that struck me uh, during my first play test at winter fantasy is how quickly we were able to go through character creation. And that was at a table with five players and uh, Nat who did an amazing job at the, the table that night. And we also had the opportunity to do an actual play th- for the podcast that's going to be released here soon. And he was our DM for that as well. Again, did an amazing job that trying to explain everything to five people going around the table. We still all had characters within, I'm going to say half an hour. And that was probably with a lot of us like, going, Oh, that's cool. And, oh, this is neat. Oh, I want to try yeah. that. So uh, streamlined, I could probably have a character for your game in 10 minutes now. Easy. And that's, and that's the hope is that uh, you don't have to, you're, 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 you're so one of the things that we do with that I did with Shadow of the Demon Lord was to make sure that character creation is an ongoing process. It's one that you that you spread out over, um, I, I guess you know the entire time you're playing your campaign. So the very, so if that's a case where you're constantly making your character, you're constantly building that character every time you're sitting down to play, and I'll unpack that in a second. Uh, that means that the pressure on the front end to make a character is, re- is re- relatively low. You just have to make a big decision and then make a few modifications and you're, you're throwing dice and, and exploring a scary world. Um, so how the game does this is that uh, there are uh, your group has a level. Your level is from 0 to 10. Uh, the game master decides when the game starts what level you're going to start at. So you might start at level 1, you might start at level, with no level, you might start at level 10, whatever you want. Um, and But assuming we start at level 0 uh, or no level... You make one big choice, and that's what kind of person you're going to play. Am I going to be a human? Am I going to be a dwarf? Am I going to be a clockwork dude? Whatever. Uh, And then you have, um, and then you go to your ancestry entry, and it tells you everything you everything you need to write in your character sheet. Uh, You get to make one big choice. You throw some dice for for your professions, and you're playing the game. That's really it's that simple. And then when you go through your first session, you uh, you kind of think about what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, obviously you do that when you're playing a role-playing game normally, but you're thinking about what you're doing because you're going to be, next time you sit down to play, you're making another big decision. So if you spent your time fighting, uh, then you might be inclined to make, to go more of a warrior choice when you, when your group hits level one. But if you found this scary book that is wrapped in barbed wire and human skin and is covered with really obscene runes and the pages are, are scrawled with blood, and there's this horrific incantation inside, and then you discover after reading it that the book whispers to you when you sleep, you know, you know, and you're starting to cast spells from this thing, you're probably going to go the route of priest of something really dark and sinister, or a magician, or something along those lines. And so as the game unfolds, and you're playing the game, you'll be making uh, these choices. So at level, group level one, you're making a novice path choice. At group level, at group level uh, three, expert path, and at group level seven, your master path. And each one of those just kind of takes you whatever direction you want. And there are no requirements, no nothing you have to do to choose a path. So if you started off as a human and you're a warrior, you might end up a mage when you make your expert path choice. And then you might go into um, jack of all trades because you can't make a decision when you hit master, for example. I, I, I think, Rob, what we bring up there is is you're you're letting the players make a really organic choice when it comes to character development. And... Uh, that's a term we certainly throw around a lot, uh, keeping the game having that organic feel and making everything um, 
uh, just be very functionally making sense in the game world and the mechanical rules. And we've certainly always tried to bring that to a game. Um, you know, we, we might make the house rule, okay, guys, we're playing 5th edition. Uh, you know, when you level up, we want to have you talk to a trainer, right. <laughs> you know, someone who's going to teach you how to do something. But it, there's still very much that disconnect of, well, I'm taking my next level. E- even though I, I've only uh, had a very brief interaction with uh, Shadows of the Demon Lord, it was, I mean, it was just beautifully simple. It was very natural, and when Nat was explaining it, it, it made so much sense. Oh, okay, well, I found this awesome book. Now I'm going to be a wizard. I've, I've been the tank of the party so far. I better learn how to be a warrior. It's, it's a really cool way uh, to recognize that, and you made it work well, in the rules, and I think that's more important. Thank you very much. It's been a, it has been an ongoing, terrifying process, but uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I can't tell you. There are, I think I have 50, I think this week was my 59th draft of the game. So, oh my god um, yeah <laughs> and you know the thing about it is that we have it's it's not like i just have a few choices right i mean the, the manuscript right now has something like three million four hundred thousand some ridiculous number of unique characters that you can possibly make from from the level 10 characters uh obviously when you're making your first choice you just choose an ancestry which is just a couple of choices uh and then you're only four novice paths but once you start stacking on the other paths that kind of lock into those it gets there are a lot, and you're a lot of unique characters. And so, with that in mind, at a 280,000 word manuscript, which for the kids at home is a 420 page book, holy crap, man! You make one change, and it spiderwebs that entire process. So, yeah. It, <laughs> but we're we're, we're uh, and it's not like and so even though there are minor changes I'm making or just kind of like you know, sanding off the rough edges, it's still like uh, I have to hunt those things down. But I'm, I'm not complaining at all. It's a lot of fun, but. Uh, there are moments where I feel like I am really Sisyphus and the boulder is real and I keep rolling it up the hill and it just rolls down the other side. <laughs> well, obviously you are approaching this uh, as a labor of love and I can just tell from talking with you, I have not had the pleasure of meeting you in person, but from my experience with the game, uh, you're obviously investing your blood, sweat and tears into something you really believe is a good quality product and that I can attest is an outstanding gaming system. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, it is. You're on the right track, man. Well, that's good. That's good. That's a, that's a big <laughs> relief. Uh, you know, it, it's a. Uh, you know, you think about it. it like my play testers, I've got uh, the al- the alpha play testers, the guys who were with who were from the very start, uh, who looked at some of my earlier drafts. You know, in, at one point, I think we were we were pretty deep into the process. They said, you know, Rob, you could stop at any time. You've got 20 good games here, uh, but. Um, <laughs> This approach uh, and the the focus and the the perfection that I'm, I'm chasing after could be tilting at a windmill, but it also comes from just, I mean, it really comes from my experience working on 5th edition D&D. That was the most difficult project I've worked on since Shadow of the Demon Lord, by far. I mean, and I would, I would even say in some respects it was even harder. And I, as much fun as that project was to work on and as honored as I am to have been part of it, it was a huge undertaking because you're looking at 40 years of, of legacy that you need to distill into a new package that can reach across the bridges, reach across those gulfs that had uh, that were created by fractures with it that show up every time you have a new edition. And so in that, and because you're you're trying to hit what was often a moving target, uh, it meant making the fighter 50 times in a three year process, or making you know, or or change or arguing over how resting works or and doing those kind of things over and over again is it is a lot of spinning a lot of wheel spinning but it also generates new content and it allows you to take, and if you have time to go down certain roads that you wouldn't normally go down you can see if you know you're always surprised that it might work or this thing i thought from the very start was going to be the most awesome thing ever just turned out to be a big pile of crap and um it, because I'm not so in, in the sense that I'm still working just as hard as I did for fifth edition. Uh, I just don't have anybody else on my team. It's just me, and and the play testers who are who I I will tell you that this game would not be possible without the people that have been playing it, giving me feedback, and supporting me throughout the entire process. It's just been great. So our our kind of our normal process. Uh, well, one is I talk more than I let Caleb talk, but I'm trying really hard to not do that. Uh, but I'm kind of the fluff guy. I'm all about the story. Rules be damned. I just want to tell a good story. As long as everybody's laughing and having fun, I could care less. 
Caleb, though he still wants to have a fun game, he's our crunch master. He's the one who likes to play with the math and figure out the nitty gritty. And I think within our limited experience, we both were very pleasantly, I don't want to say surprised, we were just very pleased with what we saw in the game that, you know, there was a there's an interesting world that we could interact with. The the abilities that each of the characters had felt fun. They felt different from each other. Um, I think I, I almost referenced it kind of like Magic the Gathering in a way is that each character, you don't have classes, but each path breaks the rules in an interesting way. It makes them feel different from the other ones. Um, but I just felt like really engaged right away. Well, this is cool. Like when I do the thing that my character does, I feel cool. I feel like it was fun. But then there were also some crunchy elements that I just thought were very interesting. I think Caleb will have more questions for you. But I just want to talk about how the fact that if you're not doing an opposed role, you're aiming for a 10. Like, that's so simple. And, you know, it's just something that I appreciate as a DM. We just recently had an episode that was very well received about 5th edition where we talked about DCs and trying to narrow it down that you really only need three numbers, 12, 15, and 18. That's really all you need. You've narrowed it down even further. All you really need is a 10. And yeah, you might occasionally run into a situation where that's not the most realistic situation, but when you're dealing with demon gods and angels, who cares? It's fun, it's fast, and I really appreciated that. Well, so here's the thing that, here's the real big thing that, uh, that struck me on the whole target number 10, because, uh, you know, when you really think about it, role playing games or the engines themselves exist purely to help you tell a story in a reasonable manner. It's all they're there for. And that's why you have these large rule sets. And I think that at some point, and I, there, I, I know, I know, somebody in internet land is going to quibble with what I just said, but whatever. I, I believe, from my perspective and my experience, that you can either play, you can either let the rules reinforce or help or help the story move forward, or you can play a game that is that is occupying within the, the, sp- the space of the rules. Uh, so if I'm just playing, if I'm just playing the rules then I'm actually not telling a story and I am just running through these exercises of trading damage uh, between me and the monster. Now, what I find, and, I'm, and this is also going to be sketchy is for me to say, because I love this game. Fourth edition, I, I adore fourth edition. I think fourth edition is a lot of fun. It was a, it was a, it was a great, great game. And it was not really, really geared towards great storytelling. It didn't mean that storytelling couldn't happen with that rule set. It's just it meant you had to active you had to actively fight the system to make it happen. And part of that is that I think that there's a tendency to overdesign in, in game in game mechanics where you have rules for everything. A friend of mine once told me that his the game the game system that they they were working with uh, showed you that the world the imaginary environment was actually a big lattice of numbers and that characters were all moving through this kind of this numeric well this kind of construct. And it was, it was a terrifying conversation because it was like, well, that's, you know, that means that you need to know that it is a DC zero to walk across a, a floor using a D&D term, right? You know, d d tells you that, or earlier editions of d d said, if I walk across a smooth floor, the DC is zero. Well, why would you ever, 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 ever have to say that in a game? Because, you know, I understand what's going on in the sense that when you're running a DC zero, you're saying, well, there's an opportunity, there's, there's, there is a possibility however remote, that my character is not going to be able to walk across the room, and I need to throw a die to determine if it's going to get across the room or not. Now, the question that I have is that how is it interesting? And if it's not interesting, then why are you even messing with it? And I don't want to, to I certainly don't want to steer this to positive because I don't like, I hate trash talking other games. I'm not trash talking other games. Uh, I want to really point out my philosophy, which is the rules exist only when you need them. When you don't need them, you're telling a story. And that's and, and so to uh, make that happen, uh, we have been um, the game tells the game urges you or the game master to say yes most of the time. So if I describe I'm going to kick this door down, if it should be possible, in most times the door just gets kicked down. If you're going to climb the wall, you just get up the wall. You only make that roll when it's iffy and it's interesting. Um, so if I'm going to climb a, a cliff wall and there are plenty of handholds, but there are a bunch of demonic, scary archer guys loosing arrows at me, then maybe you have to roll to get up there. And if you fail that roll, then maybe you can't get up there unless you change the circumstances by throwing up a rope or getting a ladder or have somebody else help you up. And then there are also, the game also kind of tells you that, you know, some things just don't happen. Uh, 
I try to shoot the moon with my rifle, or I try to balance on a cloud or swim up a waterfall. Those are fun for the right kind of game, but that's not what this game's about. And so we just have the realm of impossibility and powers the game master to say no. And so when you're having a, when you're empowering the game master to kind of make decisions about the game, you only, t you only need one difficulty or only one target number because that's all you need to worry about. It's like, it's a, it either happens or it doesn't, or it might happen. And that's all you have to worry about. And you might say that it might happen, but you have this complication that comes with it. And that's perfectly reasonable, but I don't need a rule set to tell me that. It just happens in the game through the back and forth exchange between players and game master. At least that's the hope. I think running a, a game over time is a lot like, kind of like a martial arts. You, you learn the system so well that you eventually learn that you don't need the system. But it's, it's there when you need it, when you first start. It, it helps you figure things out and follow the rules and stay balanced. But over time, you rely on it less and less and less. Right. Caleb may disagree again being the crunch master. But the other thing that I'll throw in there, and then I'll throw it back to him. I know he has some more crunchy questions. Is um, We've said on here before that anybody who plays role-playing games long enough eventually becomes amateur game designers. We tweak rules, we add rules, we subtract rules, and we try to, you know, we try to make the whatever game we're playing, we make it our own. And there were a couple choices that you made that just fit so well with my mindset, which is maybe one of the reasons why I also like it so much. One, I love starting at zero level. I, I've done that for years, even in games that aren't really designed to do that, like d and I like to start at, at zero level. I think it's fun. And then um, I love how magic is not divine and arcane. It's just magic. And it, and that, you know, the, what that means or doesn't mean or the, or the meaning that people would associate to that in the game. I just, I love that. So those are the two choices that I was like, I was completely on board with both of those. Great. Uh, the starting at zero is something I always wanted to do, but I never had a good rule set to let me do it. Um, I like letting players figure out what they want to play while playing the game rather than have to make the decision before they actually, they get to play. Uh, that's the first thing. And then magic being neither arcane or divine, different flavors of magic. That was, um, it, it, well, that was kind of, int it's intentional, obviously, but what a, the, the story hook there is that, you know, that this is just between me and your listeners and you, uh, the gods really don't exist in, sh in Shadow of the Demon Lord. They're constructs of mortal imagination, and they're given form and substance by mortal belief. So if that, they didn't really exist apart from mortals, well, then gosh, what is, then what kind of power are they getting? They're really getting power that is magic. And that idea kind of, I owe that idea somewhat, to some extent, to my time working on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, because all Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay uses or, or grapple or apprehends power from the winds of magic. And even though it's run through the filter of the gods, you know, the, the expectation is that, you know, that magic actually is coming from the winds of magic. Well, I want to, first off, for once, agree with Michael, because I really do like the magic system. I, I love the flavor behind it, um, and I like the fact that, at least in what we saw, the spells were really, really free form, and uh, it wasn't, it wasn't just the very strict and standard. This is a fireball. This is a magic missile. This is mage armor. As much as I love those kinds of spells, because I really do love that old school 3.5 system for all of its flaws and glory. I love it. But the way the magic works here in shadows well, is I just want to butt, butt in there that for Robert and I old school isn't 3.5, but go ahead. <laughs> hey, hey, for once I'm the youngest guy in the room. Sorry. Um, but that's what I learned to play. So that, that's my, that's, that's, that's my old school enough. Sure. I mean, yeah, totally. I'm on board. Yeah. I mean, that's my foundation. <laughs> that's when I'm comparing any new system, how I like it or don't like it. That's what I'm comparing it to. That's my point of reference. It's a fair, that's, that's certainly fair. But um, I mean, even just in our short taste with how the, how magic works in, uh, in shadows of the demon Lord, it just gave me that sense of kind of wonder and amazement at magic. And it was, all right, I'm a magician how am I going to use this spell? Not how do I want to cast fireball? Sure. Now, I will say, how many hit points can I take away with it? Right, right. There are fireball spells, right? And there are bolts of lightning, and there are going to be things that allow you to drop the temperature 
rapidly so so much, or 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 coat some dude in frost, uh, and so those things are those direct damage spells that just kind of do what you expect them to do. They're they're they're, they're in the game, and I think that, that you need to have those things in the game in order to scratch a particular itch and also to keep it to make to make those characters uh, I guess functional in a in a, in a more combat focused. RPG experiment, but or experience, but I do, but the, but yeah, I do. I did load up the spell chapter with all sorts of weird stuff that you know that does give you a wide range of interesting options to choose from. You know, you might choose you might choose fireball, but then again, you might choose something else, like um, uh, or you know, if you want damage spells, the one spell that comes to mind is hateful defecation, and you just make the target crap himself until he dies. <laughs> <laughs> that's seriously in the book. Yeah, <laughs> it's seriously in the book. Uh, <laughs> you are now my favorite person in the entire world. Oh, hooray! Mission accomplished. <laughs> no, yeah, well, it's like I, I was thinking about when I was making, when I was designing the spells, I was thinking about things that people had asked me over the years. They wanted to do in their D and D and their fantasy RPG games. Like, I want to create water in the dude's lungs. Well, you can't do that in other games. And I say, well, why? Why can't you do that? So let's just have a drown spell and now that now you're filling this guy up with water and it's running out of his mouth and he has to spend some number of time, some amount of time to throw up the water. Um, you know, I, I, I always thought, why, why, is it ta- why is pooping taboo in RPGs? I think it's fantastic. I mean, if you have the ability to make somebody crap, let's, let's do it, right? You know, there are a lot of spells like that. And then there are, but there are also a lot of story-driven spells where you can ask the Game Master questions and the Game Master has to answer you truthfully, which is also, I think, always interesting. Well, I, I also think um, it, it just adds into that really raw sense of danger that Shadows of the Demon Lord is, is giving to players. I'm a huge Call of Cthulhu fan. Um, Me too. Michael... Yeah, My- Michael is the D&D guy. He will always play D&D. He loves d and I'm the Call of Cthulhu guy. I will always default to Call of Cthulhu and Lovecraft, and I love those elements and features. And I- I've always seen that struggle of, okay, I'm either a worthless character in Cthulhu who just flounders around until he goes insane, or I'm kind of a badass trying to fight the monsters. But with, with Shadow of the Demon Lord, you, you've really put characters kind of right in the middle of all of that. They're, they're seeing the horrors, but they're learning how to evolve and survive. Um, just to speak to Nat's skill at this, I mean, there, there were a couple moments where I, I flubbed a roll because um, I had some sort of uh, clairvoyant spell, and, and I flubbed the roll for it. And he's like, okay, here's here's why you flubbed the roll. And he starts spinning this story about me accidentally seeing into hell. And it was boy. just a little bit of it was a little <laughs> bit of flavor. I mean, it was just a little tiny bit of you know, 30 seconds of flavor, but it just hooked me into the character and the moment so expertly. And that speaks to his skill, that speaks to your skill of creating this world and this game. Um, both Mike and I love the supernatural television show. Mm-hmm. And this game feels like that show only with, you know, swords and magic. Well, you know, the, 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 the this, there's a little secret here that uh, shadow of the demon Lord is actually four games in one. And that sounds kind of weird, but uh, it is actually four games at level zero. If your group is level zero, you're playing call of Cthulhu. If, at levels one and two, you're playing red box D and D at levels three to six, you're playing probably like something like third edition and then at level seven to ten, you're playing fourth edition as far as what your characters are able to do, and that's kind of the that's kind of the arc of how I mean, when you can even say I'm playing O D and D, Red Box D and D, A D and D, and then some other uh, more powerful game like the Epic Rules, I guess, from third edition. Um, and part of that is and, and that that whole kind of tone and the the four games in one is um, was intentional because I felt like. A game can't be one size fits all, or you get. I want you, when, with fantasy players, they have different interests and different things grab them, and why they want to play that game. And if I want to play a high octane, I want lots of moving parts on my character sheet, which I would, I would liken it to a fourth, a fourth edition or a thirteenth age kind of experience. 
then you know this game delivers and it delivers at the highest levels of the game where your characters are really complex uh, but if you want you know if, I, i'm an old school guy and what i mean by, and when i mean old school i mean first edition AD&D. Um, <laughs> i want when I, I want my fighter to be a guy who swings a sword and we resolve the combat quickly and get back to telling the story um and so I, if I want to play a game where, where I'm just doing that kind of stuff, then the game can sit comfortably in levels one and two. And so you can just, and that allows you to just kind of say, I'm going to bypass all the other stuff and just go into this, into that level band that I like the most. And then I can play for as long as I want in that particular band. And you can extend the time it takes to gain a level to two adventures or three adventures or four adventures. So that if you only want to play master, pat, master level cut characters, then you can do that. And you can do that for as long as you want. Well, I, I think uh, I think that speaks a lot to Michael's style of gameplay and storytelling. Um, yep. He and I. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, no, I was just I was just agreeing with you. Yes, that does go to my my style because I give XP as I feel necessary or not, and I'll keep you where I want you. Yeah, we don't use experience. There, there are no experience points in uh, in this game at all. We don't use any kind of. You level up when the game master says. That's three things about your game I love. See, we're gonna get we're gonna hit ten, and then we'll know that we've made it. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I I like the fact that even though, uh, even though Shadow of the Demon Lord certainly plays to that that type of game where there's so much more emphasis on the story, and there's a lot less emphasis on you know running around the battle map and doing cool things. If you want to do that. Like you just explained, you just get to that part of the game, right? And then you can and you can coast around there and have fun. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to, I, 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 this sounds. I, I love miniatures and I love using miniatures in games, uh, but I like being able to run a role playing game in a bar when I'm just drinking beer with my friends and not have to worry about character sheets or miniatures. Or if we have character sheets, we just scrawl them some just junk on on note, on note cards or whatever. So I want a game that you can play in a car, in the bar, in a plane, on a boat, wherever the hell you want to, or around a table with a battle mat and uh, and little plastic toy soldiers to push around. Uh, and it, this and you can do that at any level, right? I mean, you could do you could play a theater of the mind style game at the master path levels of, of gameplay. It's trickier, but um, it's certainly doable. And I've and our playtesting has borne that out. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the more uh, unique aspects um, of Shadow of the Demon Lord beyond uh, the the class paths, the choices you make there. There's two areas that really make the rule set unique. Um, the first is the uh, insanity corruption dynamic. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Insanity, of course. It's my favorite part of the game. It's what I am right now. All right. Uh, insanity. <laughs> so the, the what we're looking at with Insanity and Corruption, uh, we wanted, or we, uh, see, there it is. Insanity. I've already failed, I've already failed my willpower roll. <laughs> insanity is a measure of how much mental stress and anguish you have by just exploring this world. Uh, so there are... Uh, you you might gain. Um, I'm sorry. You you whenever you see something horrific, you have a chance of gaining an insanity point. Um, you can gain as a number of insanity points up to and not in excess of your willpower score. Uh, you can gain insanity from a, no a number of situations, and here are a couple. Your character dies and is brought back from the dead. You've got an insanity point from that experience. Uh, your character goes to the bathroom and finds maggots crawling around his stool after being diseased. You might gain an insanity point from that. I think I just got one from that. Right, right. Um, you, uh, Ow. you see, uh, you are hit by a burrowing centipede who crawls into your body and then doesn't come out. And then one of your buddies has to reach inside of your body and pull it out. Too bad that buddy has a Jotun. He's got softball like softball glove hands, and they're going into that wound to pull out the centipede. Wait, wait. Please tell me that actually happened in one of your playtesting development sessions. In fact, it did. In, in fact, it did. Oh. Yeah, it was, it was magical. Um, but <laughs> more traditional ways you'd get it is if you see, um, if you see, a, if you see a terrifying monster. So the first, so if you see a big herd of zombies coming at you or a demon comes crawling out of this tear in reality or, 
Uh, Demon Prince lands into the middle of nowhere and then drops his madness pulse, whatever. Uh, any number of one of these, these terrifying, strange, horrific creatures can cause characters to gain insanity. So what happens is that once you accumulate your, once you gain insanity, you become frightened for a number of rounds equal to your insanity total. Uh, frightened is a condition that means you have a bane on all, all rolls, all attack rolls, action rolls, resistance rolls. I'll talk about boons and banes in a sec. And then once you, once you're, once you're past that period of frightened, it you wears off and you're able to function at close to normal. Um, when your insanity total gets to your willpower score, you go mad. And mad, going mad is a big role in a scary table that has, um, a variety of results. The one result could mean you just die. Die of fright because you're just, that yeah, was just too much for you. And it only happens very, very rarely, but it's possible because it's a dark, it's a horror fantasy role playing game. Uh, the other, uh, you could also have a situation where you have a revelation where your character is emboldened by his madness and, uh, it is just getting, getting all sorts of big bonuses for doing certain tasks or hitting harder or whatever. If you're afraid of that, that going mad thing, you can buy off, you, you can spend your insanity points on uh, acquiring role-playing traits called quirks. And how that works is that you tell the Game Master, I'd like to, you can do this once, you can do this once per day, tell the Game Master, I'd like to get a quirk, please, and you reduce your insanity total by some number. And the Game Master gives you a role-playing trait based on what your character has experienced so far. So let's say you had gained insanity from... Um, from dying and being put and brought back, uh, dying and being brought back from the dead, uh, you might you might become you might be panic a bit when you're around a graveyard, or if you had the parasite in your guts, then you might be you might only drink water and, and only eat bread because you're afraid of disturbing the, what you believe to be the eggs that are still living inside of your belly. You know, so those are those kind of things that, that are they're just kind of role playing cues to kind of help the game move forward. And it might, it might sound punishing, but remember the the expected period of time you'll be playing a campaign. Is 11 sessions it's from start to finish 11 four-hour sessions so it's okay if your character takes some abuse because in just a few more sessions you're gonna make a new character anyway i fucking love that that is awesome hooray uh the other side of was corruption and corruption's a little bit uh a little loosey and a little bit a little a little wibbly wobbly uh as compared to insanity Insanity's fairly cut and dry Corruption's a little different um, how corruption works is that the game posits that uh, every mortal creature that's, st- that's stomping around the world from the little bunny rabbit that's cute and fuzzy in the field to the big hulking dumbass redneck that's sitting at the bar, they all have souls. And the soul is the one thing that persists from life to life. So when, you're, when you die, your mortal body dies, your soul goes to the underworld. It hangs around in the underworld for a while uh, until it forgets who, you, who it was and then it gets pooped into a new body some number of years later. Um, and that just goes on and on and on and on over and over and over again. Well, there for souls that uh, of people who do terrible, terrible things, like they learn black magic spells like Hateful Defecation or Infestation of Maggots is another spell. Um, for people who, d- who dabble in demonology or uh, necromancy, those kinds of things, they gain cor- points of corruption and that corruption stains their soul. So when the character dies, the soul sinks into hell where these... I'm using quotes that you can't see, but gods uh, or forgotten gods, uh, evil fairies, uh, other supernatural beings feed on that corruption as they're purifying the soul. And so it's an excruciating, horrific experience. No one really wants to go there, but the power that you can get from accepting corruption is pretty tempting. So what happens is that uh, you gain corruption for certain activities. This game also doesn't kind of limit what you can do with any kind of moral kind of framework. So there is no such thing as good or evil, lawful or chaotic. You're just whoever you're playing. Uh, so corruption becomes a device the Game Master can use to say, you know, you probably shouldn't have killed all those. You know, Anakin, you probably shouldn't have killed all those baby Jedis. You're going to get a couple of points of corruption for that. <laughs> and and that's kind of how it works. And the corruption will show, will manifest in gameplay as sometimes it'll be like, if you only have a few points of corruption, your character probably is just a dark and he's like, he's Rob like, you know, I've got a few points of corruption, but if, <laughs> if, you, if you have a pile of six or more, uh, you know, when you walk into a room, a baby might start crying. Animals might attack you or run away from you. Um, depending on the source of the corruption, you could get, uh, if you, if you gain corruption from learning demonology spells, your character can start becoming possessed by demons. Um, if you learn it, you get it from black magic spells, you get these really, really weird, weird quirks. 
Uh, one of the quirks is that the inverted names of all the old gods appear as a band underneath your left arm, uh, or you have a bright silver pentagram that burns in your forehead, or once per week, a child within eight miles of you just dies. Jesus. Yeah. What? <laughs> what? So that's insanity and corruption. I mean this in the in the most loving way possible, but you are a sick, sick man. I try. <laughs> and you are my hero. Hooray! So okay, <laughs> I don't I don't exactly know how you transition from that, but we're gonna try. Um, so one of the uh, mechanics that that we got to play test was the Bane and Boon mechanic. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. And right. I don't think that we got a a full. Um, explanation because I know and, and I'll let you cover it because I'm sure he'll do a better job but I want to make sure you, you cover how they stack because I, I don't think we had an opportunity where we ever had two Banes or two Boons and how those work together so if you make sure you cover that for us please Sure okay so um, you know we talked about target number of 10 uh, so whenever you're making a roll you're, there are three types of d20 rolls you make in the game there are action rolls, attack rolls, and resistance rolls and the only reason why I make those distinctions is because other things plug into those kinds of rolls and it's not worth talking about now, but uh, but just like the, the, the short description of what these things do are as follows. An action roll is when anytime you do something that it has an uncertain outcome that does not involve hurting or harming or manipulating or adversely affecting somebody else. I'm going to break down this door. That's an action roll to break down the door. If the game master says, you know, I'm not sure that you can just do that. Uh, for whatever reason. Um, if I'm going to try to climb a wall in the th middle of a fight, or I'm going to try to bounce across this slippery sheet of ice to get to the pulsing knot of centipedes that are on the other end of this, whatever, uh, you, you would make an action roll. Uh, resistance rolls are what you do when you are reacting to something that's trying to harm you. So a resistance roll might be to avoid uh, getting that parasitic infestation. Um, it might be avoiding being poisoned and so on. And then the attack rolls are, I'm trying to punch you in the face or trying to burn you, a lot, burn you up with my fire spell or whatever. All right. For action rolls and resistance rolls, the target number is always 10. Uh, and for attack rolls, the target number is the score of the attribute or the characteristic used to resist the attack. So if I'm going to try to fool your senses with an illusion spell, uh, then I would make an attack roll against your perception score. If I'm going to try to cook you with a blast of flames, I, that's just you or one, one target, I might make an attack roll against your agility score. Um, likewise, if I'm going to try to turn you inside out, I might make an attack roll against your strength score. Um, so that's how that works. So game, so having a, a, a 10 as your target number, as you, we talked about earlier, is, is, is pretty is easy, but it doesn't give you a lot of range for difficulty because after a certain point, it's going to feel like you're going to succeed in every task which the game secretly wants you to do anyway, um, but moving ahead. The game models difficulty, easier task or harder task with boons and banes. So every circumstance that would help you out with a task, you have a boon. And for every circumstance that would make your task harder, you have a bane. Boons and banes cancel each other out on a one-for-one -one basis. So if I have three boons and I have two banes, I would only have one boon. Or if I had four boons and one bane, I would only have three boons. Pretty easy. For each boon or bane you have, you throw a d6 with your d20. So let's say that I'm going to try to, I hate using the wall climbing thing, but it's easy. So let's say I'm going to climb this wall and, uh, I've got, and I've got a boon because I'm using a knotted rope and I drank a potion of super climbiness, which is not in the game, but it ought to be. And uh, then also I've got this Jotun who is pushing me up from behind, just grabbing my ass and shoving me up the wall. Now, at this point, a game master should probably just say, you know, you just get up the wall, but for the purposes of this discussion, uh, what, would happen, what would happen would be I would roll a d20 and roll three six-sided dice to go with it. I would then only add the highest of the six-sided dice rolled. Uh, so if I rolled a three, four, and a one, I would add four to my roll of a d20. And then I would find out if I equal or beat 10, then I succeed, otherwise I fail. Banes work just like that, except you, instead of adding, you subtract. So the benefit of having boons not stack or be cumulative, and the benefit of not having banes is the same thing, is that A, it controls the math of the game, and B, it allows the game master to just throw boons and banes around at, as often as you want. So there's something you do in like, uh, in, in like a lot of, uh, well, third edition games. Um, one of the, the, the game you're actually playing in third edition is bonus hunting. Uh, you look for all the bonuses you can and accumulate all the bonuses you can to mitigate the randomness of the d20 roll. 
Um, in 5th edition D&D, the game you're actually playing when you're rolling dice is looking for ways to get advantage. To either offset or cancel out disadvantage, or just to have advantage and throw two dice. So the same kind of thing is going on in, in Demon Lord. The, mechanic game, the mechanical gameplay you're doing is boon hunting and bane mitigation. Uh, so if I say that you have a really good idea and you already have two boons in the roll, I can give you a third boon without really inflating your numbers because you're going to be capped at a plus six bonus. So that's, that is, it's fairly useful to, it's a useful tool for game masters who are just kind of getting their feel because you can give out those bonuses without having to worry about them getting way too out of hand. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, and I just, I, I think that's elegant. Uh, I'm a big fan of advantage, disadvantage. I've talked so many times about how much I love that as a, as a mechanic in fifth edition, because it takes away so many issues that I think that, like you said, people are just looking for all these little advantages, but I love the fact that they don't just are, aren't cumulative because then you could get someone who's just trying to be very gamey, trying to figure out three ways to get boons because they know that that's going to get them above the 10. And I think this allows you to focus more on the story. And if there's something there that seems like it should be a boon, then you reward it. And it's not a game breaking thing that you happen to get four boons on this particular role. And I just, I really like the way that works. And I like the fact that they are not cumulative. I think that's a great design element. Thank you. Well, and I, and I think it makes a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities for fun when you're playing the game. Because, I mean, just in our quick little taste of the system uh, with some of the pregens we had, uh, I, I think specifically it was Michael's Rogue uh, or Halfling. I forget what you played. I think you always had a boon on your attack roll. Yeah, there's a mechanic. That right, was called. a Halfling Warrior. Right. Uh, all, uh, well, you're Halfling. Right. Warriors gain a boon for, it's just called combat training as a talent, and they get a boon for all attack rolls. With weapons. So, it, I mean, it's just a cool way to always make them a little bit better than everybody else. Yep. Um, kind of replacing the older system of, you know, a base attack bonus right. that would keep increasing at a faster pace or something. Um, but, yeah, like Michael said, uh, the advantage-disadvantage thing is is really simple. I'm not as big a fan of it as Michael is. Uh, but I am a really big fan of the Bane slash Boon mechanic. Uh, I think it's entertaining, um, and I think it it gives people like me who like shaking that big handful of dice yeah. the taste of that. Right. But it takes away the need to then sit there and add up thirteen different dice numbers and try to figure out what I got. Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And it's I, there's there's a one of the things that we. I remember from my time on the fifth edition team, we just we just accepted the fact that gamers like to roll dice, and we don't want to take that away. But uh, there's got to be a way to allow gamers to roll dice without having to make them really work at it. So it's just a, it, the feeling of throwing something really big at the table, punishing that table for just being there by pounding dice off its surface. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, um, one question I had that. We didn't really come up with a lot in our play test, um, but Nat touched on it briefly. Uh, is there a critical hit and miss mechanic? Oh, yes, there is, sort of. We, uh, yeah. We kind of glossed over it. We had, uh, for a long time, um, when we I, there was a rule in the game, which I'm even reluctant to even talk about because it it's, it's dead and buried and it's not coming back. But I'll tell you what it was. <laughs> Uh, whenever you rolled a 1, uh, you would have a bane for all rolls until the end of the next round. And whenever you rolled a 20, you would have a boon for all rolls to the end of the next round. The trouble, it was, it was, it was fun, but the problem was that it was not, une- it was a, it was using a hammer to solve a problem that needed a screwdriver. Um, cause it was easy to sidestep that problem. And, you know, rolling a 1 just sucks. You don't have to add anything else to it to make it suck even worse. Uh, there's not like some sort of weird divine being out there that says when you roll a one, you have to burn your house down and kill everyone you know. It's just a crappy result on a roll and the game moves forward. So I realized that I need to get, I need to offload some of my, my, my more brutal sensibilities. And I set that mechanic aside. So what are you now for 20s and ones? Um, actually, let me back up. The other reason is that if you're fighting a lot of creatures and one fight, say you're fighting 10 skeletons against your four player characters, uh, the skeletons are more likely to roll a one than you are. And so when you're a game master and you're having to manage all the boons and banes on your monster side, it, it, it weighs against the GM quite a bit. 
So what we did instead, or what I did instead, was uh, I offloaded the one effect and I blew up the 20 effect and then tailored uh, benefits on the roll of d20 within the paths. So whenever a warrior rolls a 20 on the die for an attack roll a weapon, uh, your, your attack does 1d6 extra damage. Um, when the magician doesn't get anything from his path, but uh, spells that have attack rolls inside them uh, have a critical effect built in. And then I think the priest has a chance to stun the target that you hit with your weapon, and the rogue, on rolling a 20 with a weapon attack, gets to take, an, gets to take one extra turn that round. Which then I mean it's an extra. So if you took if you went on a fast turn and you rolled a twenty, you could act again on a fast turn or a slow turn. So going back to what you we touched on a little bit earlier, instead of just being extra damage or a bigger number, in Shadow of the Demon Lord, when you get a crit, you get to do something really damn cool. Yeah, I mean warriors are just doing more damage, but that's what that's kind of what's. It's kind of like opening a can of tuna fish and expecting beans where it should actually be tuna fish. And so I think that's kind of the thing where it's with warriors, like, well, yeah, warriors should just probably do more damage. I mean, I could, we could, I, I, I entertain the idea of having, you could knock the guy across the room or, or something like that. But I think those are, those kind of more, and I use this reluctantly, cinematic effects probably should be uh, relegated to the top half of the game. Where you're expecting when you're playing master path little characters, you probably want to break or bend the rules of, of reality a little bit beyond what we normally would expect. Gotcha, and I agree with you. You're you're absolutely right. Let's let's uh, touch on something you brought up real there, uh, real quickly there. The fast turns and the slow turns, um, kind of how your new system handles initiative. So let's let's touch on that real quick. I have long wrestled with initiative and. You know, it, it is a funny story. Uh, not really funny at all. It was one of the more obsessive compulsive. Pro- Rob probably really needs therapy moments. But uh, I remember one of the reviews I read when a Song of Ice and Fire role playing came out. That was one of the that was the last game I designed uh, for Green Ronin Publishing. And I remember the 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 review was like, and the initiative system is you know there's nothing special there. It's the same old same old. And that stuck with me. And that was years ago, right? I mean, that's one of those things that's been like <laughs> hanging like an albatross around my neck for all those years. All right. So now you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, uh, with Shadow of the Demon Lord, I had a bunch of initiative systems in place. At one point, when we were using the full spectrum of D&D dice, your path would determine what die you used. You could have a cumulative initiative dice. And, you know, there was one night and I was getting frustrated because we, uh, we, we had just I had run through yet another iteration of the initiative system. And I found myself still going through the same annoying process of recording everyone's results, putting them in order, and then having to sort out who takes their turn when. And I realized when I was doing that, that what is initiative's sole per what, what is it there to do? Initiative is to give the player characters a shot at doing enough damage before the monster can do damage to them. That's all it's there for. And it doesn't matter after the first round, because once you establish the pattern, the pattern just shakes out and the combat proceeds as it is. Once you have an initiative system where it's a it's a fixed result, where you roll a die, you add a number to it, and that tells you when you act, then you also have to bring in whole sorts of rules about delaying, readying actions, waiting, uh, refocusing, doing all sorts of other stuff that just adds a ton of mechanics. So I realized that you don't need initiative if you just accept, first of all, you accept that the players are always going to go first and then build it into the monster math. You're good. You're good. Uh, so uh, what we, so the way, way it works now is that uh, co- uh, combat round has three basic parts. You have fast turns, slow turns, and the end of the round. Combat starts. Uh, you guys against my group of uh, three armed orcs that had just taken Viagra. And they're coming to tear you apart. Uh, <laughs> so you're up against these guys. I described, I set the scene. These guys just break out of a Kmart and uh, they've got chainsaws and they're sporting really unseemly <laughs> stuff going down, going on downstairs and they're coming after you. I say, what do you want to do? So run away, run away. Right. So of course, <laughs> why the hell wouldn't you leave? <laughs> Uh, yes, go. I have a theory. No one wants to. If, that's, if you're ever going to get to, if you ever think you're getting to a fight, pack Viagra because no one wants to fight you when you're sporting wood. <laughs> anyway, genius. Uh, this moment of genius brought to you by the RPG Academy <laughs> featuring Rob Schwalb. So uh, 
you have described so you, what's a scene set up? You can take a fast turn or a slow turn. So uh, it goes to players first. Unless you're surprised, players get to get to decide uh, if they're going to act, if they're going to go. If you decide to take a fast turn, uh, you can do one of two things. You can move up to your speed or you can use an action. Once you complete your turn, you're done for the round. So once all the players who want to take a fast turn have taken a fast turn, it then shifts back to the game master. Any creatures or traps or hazards or whatever uh, under the game master's control can then take fast turns. Again, they can either use an action or move up to their speed. Normally, once a creature wraps its turn, it's done for the round. So once fat players have done fast turns, Game Master has done fast turns, it goes back to the players. Players who have waited can take a slow turn. And on a slow turn, they can use an action and move up to their speed. Once all that's done, it goes to Game Master, Game Master, use an action and move up to your speed. End of the round is just clean up. So you track durations or uh, characters who are dying, they roll to see what happens to them. And any on any end of the round effects like poison gas and all that kind of stuff is resolved then. And you just do that over and over again until it's done. And when I first revealed this initiative system to my players, I can't tell you the outcry, the shrieks and fear and loathing and just horror at what abomination I had, uh, I had unleashed on what they were hoping was going to be their new favorite game. And then they played it and they loved it. And so far, every play, every play test I have run, uh, from Greenville, South Carolina to Seattle, Washington, everyone's loved it. So I'm going to take that as okay. So I, I will jump in there um, because I, I, if, there, if there was anything about the game that I wasn't sold on from that initial play test in Winter Fantasy was the initiative system. It was the one thing that I was like, I don't, I don't quite get it. Now, having said that, playing it again this last time, knowing what it was and played again, I loved it. See? So that... That first game didn't quite I didn't quite get enough of it that first game to quite to to really understand it. But yeah, by, by the time we were halfway through that second game, I'm like, I get it, I like it, uh, definitely a, a positive. Great. Uh, what I found is that people just love the 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 free form uh, structure or lack of structure. They like the ability to talk to each other and make plans, and and they don't have to worry about like, well, I have to wait until this guy does his thing when it should be more like. Don't go attack him yet. I'm going to go fill that room with fire first, or I'm going to make him hatefully defecate, then attack him. You know, something. Like, <laughs> you know, that's and that's and that's kind of that that neat kind of inter interplay. And yeah, I know that there there are instances where you have an alpha person, alpha personality who says, "I'm going to go first every time." But what I find is that, and this is with all sorts of all sorts of different gaming groups, that they usually sort that that, that themselves. Once it stops, once people realize that their individual character in the game isn't important, it's just your, your character is not important. The game doesn't care about your character. Your character can live and die. It doesn't matter. What's important is the group. It's an ensemble cast. And when the, and so you are all plugged in and working together to do the thing. And I'm being very upfront about that because I think that if the game suggests that you can create your special snowflake, that, uh, that, that's dangerous because it, it means that it's more about what you can do and not what you do with your team. And so one of the nice things about initiative is that the spotlight doesn't necessarily fall on you and linger there for a long period of time. Rather, the spotlight's falling on the group. How's a group going to react to the situation? What's a, what's a group going to do now? Well, it also really keeps all the players keyed into the action. Yeah, it totally does. And, and we, we brought this up while after we discussed the game with Nat the other day. You can't tune out the game when it's not your turn. Right. It forces everyone to say, oh, okay, what are you doing? Let me balance it out. Um, the the term um, popcorn initiative gets thrown around a lot, and, and I like that concept, uh, but this, the way you're doing it here, feels a lot more cooperative, and it, it feels like it, it gives players a chance to set up more awesome things. Right, and that's important. And, and one of the things I, I want to pull out of a statement you, you made a couple minutes ago, you said normally monsters get the fast turn or the slow turn. Oh. Now, I'm going to extrapolate from that that more powerful bosses might get multiple actions. Yeah, there are some, there's some really, really nasty shit in the, in, in, the, in the book. You know, if you fight a dragon at the higher, you know, a, a, a higher difficulty dragon, uh, like a large or a huge dragon... That, that guy gets to go on fast and slow. 
And he also gets to do something in the end of the round. <laughs> a little bit of a fourth edition vibe there. Yeah, well, with, right, with... yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with, with, with uh, I mean, as I, I, I said earlier, that I really like fourth edition and I like a lot of parts about it. And so keep the stuff that I like and see what I can adapt it for this system. But yeah, a lot of... A lot of the creatures, a lot of the, the what you would, if you were to use 4th edition terminology, solo monsters, they are, they're dynamic, they're fun to run, and they can do all sorts of really terrifying things. I like that. I, I think that's awesome. I, um, even playing, I guess what we would call a, a first level encounter that we did with Nat the other day, uh, I still felt pretty threatened by a lot of the monsters we faced, and I was the first PC to go down. So, oh no! Uh, oh yeah. Wasn't burrowing centipedes, was it? Uh, no. What what killed me? Well, um, you didn't actually die. We were able to bring you back up. I think it was the maggot, the acid spitting yeah, maggots. Yep, acid spitting oh, maggots. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but I I like the sense of I like the sense of danger that we had in the game, but it didn't feel like the danger was there because I was a shitty first level character. I, I was really invested in the danger of the world and of the story. So you kind of you kind of put me in, in in Michael's shoes a second. You took me out of the crunchy side of things Great. and shifted me. Yeah, shifted me <laughs> over to the story. I, I, one of the things I really like about the character sheets, um, going back to kind of that crunchy side of things to wrap it up, it's just so simple and streamlined. I mean, there's basically four physical stats, and then perception. Yep. And I didn't feel cheated. Like when I when I play fifth edition, I feel a little bit cheated when it comes to things like skills. But I did not feel like that with something like Shadow that is even more stripped down and streamlined. Yeah, yeah. I never felt that. So kudos to you. Thanks. You know, skills are really – that is uh, – if you want to get me angry and spitting, skills is one of the ways to do it. Um, I am, I'm sorry. I take no, it no, all no, back. No, no, no. It's you're, – it's, it's, I'm glad you picked it out because it's one of those things that I have um, – it took me a while to figure out what my problem with skills – what it really is. And it's because D&D in first and second – first edition – wasn't didn't have skills. It had secondary skills, and they were just descriptive, right? They were I'm a bowyer Fletcher. I'm an armorer. Just kind of professional base kind of things. The game just suggested that you're not you don't you don't you just you just don't need skills to, to play the game. You just use the rules you got. Uh, and I, I know that there are a lot of people who felt that was a really crappy way to play, but but bear with me. Proficiencies, and this is also probably going to get me tarred and feathered. Proficiencies from second edition was, in my opinion, probably the best expression of skills for D and D ever. And it doesn't that it's not because they worked really well, but because but it's because they worked with the system as it was written. Basically, you didn't have and so let me unpack this a little bit more. In third edition, the basic task resolution to do any task in the game, you're rolling a d twenty, you're adding an ability score modifier to it. You compare the total to a target number, your difficulty class, if you, or if you're making an attack roll against your armor class, right? We all know this. That's the basic mechanic. Skills, however, uh, allow you to do, you're not, you're adding yet another thing to it. So if you're, so what happens is that the numbers just get really big. I'm just trying to be brief about this rather than getting into a long drawn out thing about it. But the problem was, is that they, that it felt tacked on. It felt like it was screwed on to a game that was working really, really well without it. Fourth edition carried that forward. Fifth edition repaired it somewhat with the proficiency bonus. But I still feel like anytime that you have something like climb as an object, a game object in the game that says, when I want to climb, I refer to this particular thing in the book. That means that there's a right way to do things. And I'm kind of all over the place. But I guess what it's saying <laughs> is that it's like, see, that's what I'm saying, like passing a gallstone talking about skills. <laughs> I want if ability scores are going to if ability scores are going to have meaning and have value in the game, don't have numbers that are bigger than the ability scores. Add to them. That's the problem with third edition skills. The, the the modifiers you get from your skills can be up to three times or four times your modifier, which means that your skill mod, your skill bonus becomes four times more important than the ability score that's attached to. Which means some window licker and uh, you know and some Oxford scholar can be in the same room. And they, but they, and they have accumulated 23 ranks of used rope. They're, they're both going to succeed all the time, 
regardless of the fact that one guy, you know, picks his nose and craps his pants, and the other guy, you know, plays chess for the Masters, they're both equally proficient at use rope. That's ridiculous. So we we don't it just does it doesn't make any sense. So with with Shadow of the Demon Lord, I decided that I'm not going to do skills because I want task resolution to rest on the attribute scores and modifiers. And there are only four then because they're really because why split it up? If I split up strength into strength and some endurance stat, uh, then you're then having to make a choice. Do I want to be super strong but have no endurance? Who is that person? I've always wanted to know in D and D land. Who is a guy that's got an 18 strength and a 9 constitution? I'd like to meet this guy. <laughs> I, just, I just can't wrap my head around what that... What, I mean, I'm sure in some corner case world that makes sense, but I don't... I have no idea on a regular basis. Same thing goes with, like, I have a, I have a high intelligence, uh, but I have a low wisdom. Sure, I know there are people who make the whole Sherlock Holmes thing, but that's just garbage. You just... Why make the difference? Why make the distinction? Uh, I even thought, and that's why the game doesn't have a, a charisma score or any kind of personality thing, because I hate that kind of pseudo gameplay. It, I'd rather just role play. There are there are tasks where they're going to be in, you make a, a smart or a, a mental attribute role to see if you can convince the dude to take your bribe or to believe your bullshit. Uh, but uh, typically, we don't. Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm, I'm rambling. <sighs> skills. I agree. Anyway. Skills are stupid. I would rather, I mean, just I wish for the, 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 to be to be brief, and I've, I've failed already. Uh, to be even briefer, <laughs> you can have an ability score game, or you can have a skill game. It doesn't make sense to have both ability scores and skills. That's all I'm saying. So have fifty, have a game with fifty skills in it, no ability scores. Go freaking crazy with that, but don't tell, but don't try to do both. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm probably. See, I, I, I can. There's somebody out there who's really angry at me right now. It's probably Caleb. It's not though, because I I'm realizing that you're absolutely right. I mean, I still love third edition. Oh, I love third edition too. I'm done, yeah, I'm, I'm not trashing on it. I'm just saying. Oh no, no, I'm, yeah, I'm not either. But you 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 point out a very valid point, a valid truth about the system, and I am <clears throat> a I am a mature enough person to admit that yeah, that's a pretty shitty, stupid way of doing things. Well, you know, and if you're going to say that, if you're going to say that listen is a skill, um, then why isn't attacking with a sword? Yeah. Uh, right? And if you, so if there's this kind of really murky line between, well, we know, we, we know as, as gamers, we have to accept that the line, which if you, if you put weapon skill in with the other skill, everyone's going to put all their skill points into weapons and, you know, then they're going to neglect their, their history roles. Oh, for fuck's sake, screw that. I don't want to ever have to be. I don't ever want to have somebody say, "Well, I've got forty-three ranks in knowledge, history, uh, the middle period, the blue period, uh, Picasso." I don't want to ever have to sit and then tell the game master that's on my character sheet. I chose that instead of tumble. You know, the game master should be able to reach across the table and smack the crap out of that player because it tells the player that I'm forcing the game master to create circumstances where Picasso's blue period is important to the adventure at least once every three games in order to justify this really, really shitty choice I made. I've played with that person, Rob. I have played with that person, and I agree with you. See, I I would much rather say you just know about Picasso's blue period, and you didn't have to give up anything to get it. You just know it. It's kind of like sure. I, my character. I mean, this. So what we do in Demon Lord is that we have professions, and professions are just big, broad descriptors. So I have the shopkeeper profession. But what does that mean? Says the player, and the game master says, "You tell me what that means. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's just a thing. It doesn't cost you anything to get it. It doesn't affect your character's performance. Your character is not going to have. He, he's not at risk of having to go to the hospital because he was rock hard for four hours. It's just a thing you have, right? I mean, it's." <laughs> Please edit that last bit out. <laughs> oh no, that's gold. That's that's going to be the trailer. That's going to be the end. That's going to be the blurb. <laughs> that 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 alone will skyrocket Shadow of the Demon Lord to right. epic sales proportions. <laughs> Every book. This is see. It's a stretch goal. Every book comes with four tabs of Agra. <laughs> <laughs> and if we hit the next, and if we hit the next stretch goal, it becomes Cialis because you never know when you get into a fight. Right. <laughs> That's right. You have to be ready at a moment's so, notice. You ready so, at a moment's notice. A whole a whole new form of kung fu is evolving right now. 
<laughs> so I'm uh, I'm usually the fluff guy, which is a bad choice of words based off our current conversation. And Caleb is a crunch <laughs> a master. Bit, phrasing. But I have been focused more on the crunch and the mechanics because I, f- I feel like they, they do a great job of representing the theme and enforcing the theme of the game. So I kind of feel like I've neglected that, though. Uh, we really haven't talked about what Shadows of the Demon Lord is about. We've talked about all the mechanics and how it works, but like, what is the world that you're playing in? What is the ambiance that you are in when you play a game? Well, um, yeah, that is a good question. Um, Shadow of the Demon Lord is posits that you are playing in a fantasy world that's just on the cusp of an industrial industrial revolution. What that means is that you're going to have pistols because gamers want pistols in their fantasy. So why say no? Uh, it's going to have clockwork dudes. It's going to have airships. It's going to have crazy magic. And it's going to have factories that belch all sorts of pollution into the air. It's a, it's it's kind of. Um, Tone wise, I would say it's somewhere between uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and Catalan, if you remember that game from Rackham. All right. The difference, though, is that this is a world that is teetering on the edge of annihilation. And the reason for it is that reckless use of magic or some other catastrophe has caused this cosmic being known as a demon lord who lives in the gaps between realities. And it's drawn his attention, and or its attention, rather. And as the Demon Lord gets nearer, uh, it's pounding on the walls of, 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 of reality, and it's trying to break through. Now, it can't move through unless those barriers are gone, but there are fissures and cracks and gaps that are, that are, that are forming in it, and his essence is, cast, is, be, is passing through those gaps and casting a shadow, not a literal shadow, but a figurative shadow on the world. And so things are starting to speed up and go to hell really fast. Now, um, the apocalypse angle is is kind of central to the game, but it's not. I'm sorry, it's central to the to the story, but it can be something that is in your face, or it can be something that's kind of in the background. And if you want it in the background, it can. The gameplay is like a, a grim, gritty, dark fantasy RPG. But if you want to if you want to die, crank up the, the, the crank it up, uh, you can you can really go all all out. And uh, the, the game provides mechanisms for modeling uh, your your dying world. The mechanism is called the Shadow of the Demon Lord mechanic, basically. So the idea is that wherever the shadow falls on some element in the campaign setting uh, or the world uh, causes some sort of really terrible thing to happen. So let's say the Demon Lord casts a shadow on the underworld. Well, by casting a shadow on the underworld, the gates to the underworld are sealed shut. So what happens when mortals die, their souls have nowhere to go. They just rise back up as zombies, and now you have a zombie apocalypse. Maybe the shadow falls on this super powerful grand druid dude. And, you know, by being corrupted by the demon lord, he's starting to go a little crazy. And he realizes that humanity is responsible for all the ills in the world. So he releases a global pandemic. And now there's this horrific disease that's cutting swaths through civilization. Or it could be an entire people is corrupted by the demon lord and rising up and casting down the empire. Or magic can be corrupted a la Wheel of Time. So every time you cast a spell, there's a risk of poisoning your soul. And they, they're, they're a lot more, there are several more examples, all the way down to some sort of Godzilla-like creature crawling out of the ocean and stomping across the countryside. Sweet. The idea is that you this could be like a constant thing. So if I run a campaign, I want to run a zombie apocalypse campaign. I know some people find that tired, but it's I think, but a lot of people still like to play it. Uh, that could be the, that could be the tone of the campaign. Uh, I could also say that it starts as a zombie apocalypse. And then the player characters, say in their novice path, do something to stave off that disaster. So the shadow of the demon lord falls to something else. So in this model, we might say that halfway through the campaign, you stop the zombie apocalypse, but the shadow of the demon lord falls on the grand druid dude who's now mad about all these corpses and then leads to the global pandemic. Well, you guys deal with the the grand druid, but then the shadow falls in the archmage and now magic's poisoned. And so it could be a, the apocalypse can change during your campaign. Your apocalypse could change every session you play if you wanted to. And that gives you a wave. It gives, and the mechanics are relatively light, but they are like, if you remember Magic's global enchantments, do you play the card and it affects how you play the game? It's just like, it's not just like that, but it's like a template for your, for your world. And it's a one paragraph template, not, a, not an endless laundry list of things you have to make changes to. No, I think that's very, very cool. Yeah, you're basically throwing flavor on on the existing system, the existing setting, just to make it more entertaining. Right. And now another thing about the setting, too, is that I don't... People have asked me if I'm going to do a big, humongous campaign book. And my answer to that has always been no. 
and there's a reason for it. I love a lot of the a lot of the very famous venerable D and D settings. I love them with all my heart and soul. I love Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I love all these. I love all these worlds are created for art fantasy RPGs. But I am also intimidated by these fantasy worlds because of the amount of work is required for me to gain mastery of it. There is nothing more emasculating in a game. Well, there are things which we won't talk about, but. One of the most emasculating things that happen in a game is when you present information about a world to your gaming group, and there's somebody in your gaming group who knows more about the world than you do. And while not everybody's an asshole, uh, there is, I don't want to create situations where a player can know more about the setting than the person who's, t who's shaping and refereeing and narrating the story. So what I'm doing with Demon Lord is a bit different from other games, from other uh, fantasy RPGs, in that I'm not I'm not going to present a super ultra richly detailed world. Rather, I'm painting in very broad strokes, and we will reveal the world through the adventures that we produce for it. So we'll have big, big, high level pictures about this is this place, this is this place. There might not even be a, a continent map. There's going to be a regional map at least, and then adventures will zoom in at various points. Because the idea, and again, I want to draw this home, is that if you played in the Shadow, Shadow of the Demon Lord campaign with me, I would only ask you to invest 11 weeks of your time to play that campaign. So if I'm only going to ask you to invest 11 weeks of your time to play that campaign, then I don't need 320 pages of setting material to, 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 to make you read through to run that game. You just need enough to get you, enough information that you can use your own creativity and imagination to fill in the gaps. That makes perfect sense. It's nice and simple. 100% agree. I, I've seen that happen, and actually just very recently in, in an actual play podcast that I was listening to, it uh, doesn't matter which one, but they were running a pre-made adventure, and there was a moment where a character said, or player said, uh, what's the shopkeeper's name? And there was like a five-minute pause while the DM flipped through the book to try to find the name of the, the <laughs> shopkeeper. And and if you were making it up on the fly, you'd just say it's Bob or it's Frank or it's Tom because it's so unimportant in the grand scheme of things. And that's sort of a microcosm of what you're talking about is that when you have such a rich, right. detailed world, it's great until it's not great. And it's not great when you get caught up on those right. details that really don't affect the fun of the game. They just slow things down. So, Rob, we've, we've really gone over all the cool things that make Shadow of the Demon Lord really unique, make it really simple, organic, really, really fun. Uh, you've told us a lot about the world that we're going to be in, uh, kind of the freedom we have to go crazy and make all these bonkers, bananas things happen. Um, the the turnaround here is that we all want this book in our hands so we can start rolling dice, start building characters. Um, tell us how this is going to come into reality for us. So it all depends on you guys. Uh, we I'm launching a Kickstarter campaign on March 12th. Um, and I'm asking for 30 grand to get the very basic form of the game into print. Uh, 30 grand will pay for art. Uh, it'll pay for editing, uh, art direction, layout, and printing, shipping, and distribution. If we fund and we start hitting stretch goals, the book blooms and blossoms into this magnificently massive beast. Uh, the, more, the more stretch goals we hit, the bigger the book gets. Um, and that's how it's going to run. But right now it's going to be 128 page, which gives you everything you need to make a character, play a character, run a game, and um, it'll even have a bestiary inside of it and a light touch of the world with it. So basically all the rules you need to play plus uh, character creation stuff. Uh, to go along with it, we're going to put out a PDF called Tales of the Demon Lord, and that is a set of four, or f uh, five adventures for the game that are for starting characters, novice characters, and expert characters. And they just give you enough to kind of get started. And the adventures, uh, they design the adventures to be one page of content per hour of gameplay. So adventures will be between two to four hours long, uh, two to four pages long. So it's fairly slim uh, expansion. Other stretch goals that will uh, as that we unlock will give adventure content by some of the finest in the industry. Uh, we can, if we hit stretch goals, we can see adventures by Chris Pramis, Bruce Cordell. Shane Hensley of, of Savage Worlds fame, Monty Cook, uh, Skip Williams, Steve Winter. The list goes on and on and on. We're also planning on doing fiction uh, for as part of stretch goal reward, uh, hitting stretch goals. And we've got uh, Aaron Evans, Richard Byers, and uh, Eric Scott to be, plus even Elizabeth Bear. 
Uh, we have a really, really, uh, just a great, great group of people who are going to help make this game even more awesome once we fund. So, and then once they, uh, assuming that everything goes right, the stars are aligned properly, or planets as well, the game should be in your hands by the end of this year. The game's written. We just have to pare it down to fit whatever page count we're going to end up with. Right. So do you know what the, um, like if, if I want the, the, the book, the actual book, not a PDF, do you know what sort of range that's going to be in for the Kickstarter? Uh, so for the book and the PDF and Tales and the starter PDF, which is the best bundle, best bang for your buck is 60 bucks. And that includes a $10 shipping coupon or credit, okay. which will get you basic shipping to anywhere in the U.S. And that's then, a steal. Yeah, that's great. That's a beautiful price point. <laughs> yeah, so I figured 60 bucks for you get a PDF and you get the print product and you get five adventures and you get a starter PDF that you can print off and hand your gaming group to make their first characters. That's pretty good. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. And then, of course, if you want to give more, we're going to have tons of add-ons. We'll have uh, Demon Lord dice available and T-shirts and all that good stuff. Oh, dice. That's cool. Uh, not that cool. I need any more dice, but dice are always something I, I always look at. If it's on a Kickstarter, 100%, I'm going to at least look at it. You know, those Demon Lord dice are pretty selective. <laughs> awesome. Well, Robert, I I think oh, we've man. had a fantastic conversation. I, obviously, I'm a fan of the game. Uh, I was a fan of the game of Winter Fantasy, even more so after playing with uh, with Nat. And our conversation with you has been fantastic. I I can't imagine this won't fund, but I will offer you my hope that it does and, and you blast out your, your stretch goals and you have a great, huge success. I certainly plan on being one of your backers. I think it's awesome. Well, I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Robert. I mean, this was hands down one of the, the best, most fun conversations we've had. Uh, your stories, your your expertise, I'm just blown away. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks a lot. It was my pleasure to be here. All right, guys. Well, we want to take a second here to send a couple specific thanks out to you guys in audio world. We want to send a shout out to Ricardo, who is our newest patron over on our Patreon page. Uh, Ricardo is sending us a little bit of coin to help keep this RPG Academy train moving down the tracks. So thank you so much, buddy. We do appreciate that. Anybody who wants to can swing over to patreon.com slash the RPG Academy. Check out what we can hook you up with for a few bucks here and there. If you have a second, throw us a review as well. Um, we actually have a brand new five-star review on iTunes America uh, from a good buddy of our show, NPC Chris. Chris says, one of the coolest things about listening to RPG Academy is hearing the commitment to quality and passion that Michael and Caleb bring to the show. Their passion for RPGs is infectious, and their work ethic and overall dedication to continually improving their product is incredibly inspiring. They live and breathe RPGs. Man, those are some nice words, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't read that before I read it, <laughs> and I'm kind of blown away right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I I super appreciate that. I know um, I feel a, a, a brotherhood with the NPC cast. It just sort of happened that their show and our show came out relatively near the same time. I don't know. I think our show might be like a week older. Their show might be a week older. And they were one of the first ones that I started listening to. And so I, feel, I kind of feel like I've listened to them grow and um, and to have them kind of keep up with us, they've had us on their show a couple times. I've been on, or they've been on ours a couple times, and uh, I just I think they do an amazing job, and they are one of the podcasts that their audio quality is so good that I have strived to get to their level. To have him kind of recognize that and 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 tell us we're doing a good job really does mean a lot to me. So Chris, thank you so much for for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for attending the RPG Academy and listening to our podcast. We do this out of love for the hobby and for you, our fans. This podcast and site content will always be free for you to enjoy and utilize. But we do have expenses related to the show. If you'd like to help out in any way, please visit patreon.com slash the RPG Academy and check out the rewards we are providing for your monthly pledges. We will use all funds that come in to improve the show and give you better content and quality. 
And if you don't have the coin to spend, don't worry. You can still help us out in numerous ways. One, you can subscribe to our show on iTunes, or you can leave us a five-star review on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. Also, if you clear your cookies and then visit Amazon or drive through RPG through our portal, we get a kickback from your orders, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Just like an RPG, our site works best with open lines of communication. We love talking with our listeners about everything. Please contact us with any questions, concerns, and comments you have. We also love to hear feedback and experiences from your own games. You can email us via podcast at vrpgacademy.com, or you can reach us on social media such as Facebook and Google+. We are there under the RPG Academy. But Twitter is usually the fastest way to reach us. You can find my favorite co-host, Caleb G., at... The Caleb G. And you can find my favorite co-host, Michael, at The RPG Academy. Thanks for listening. And as always, if you're having fun, you're doing it right.